another Lexington class. Oh, good ships. Really good ships and really pretty ships. And would have been really pretty darn pretty battle cruisers. So why, considering they are finished off as aircraft carriers, at least two of them are, why are they on this list? Because, you know, they're, they're built. Well, here is the thing we're talking about. The US Navy wasn't planning one battle cruiser, not two, not three, but six. They were going to be given names like Lexington, Constellation, Saratoga, Ranger, Constitution, and United States. These are big names. These are really big names. Constitution and United States. Imagine those ships in their service. The USS United States turns up anywhere. You can't have a higher profile of American interests in a something than sending the ship which is literally named for America. But there's also USS Constitution. Now think about that. Constitution. And USS Constellation. These are big names. Really big names. Not names you put on a ship just because it's going to be a capital ship, or it's going to have status because it's a battle cruiser into your first class of battle cruisers. They're not names you just apply to any ship. Yes, you've got the state naming convention for um, for cap for battleships. So you could have just stuck with state names, but you didn't. You could have carried on with the Saratoga and Lexington theme, you know? Uh, naming these ships for... For battles in the American War of Independence. For example, there could have been Concord. USS Concord. That would have kept with that theme. You could have carried on with that theme and you would have still had very prestigious names given to these ships. But they wouldn't have been as prestigious as Constitution, United States and Constellation. Even Ranger. In fact... The really interesting thing is that CC1, the original hull ordered at Four River Shipyard at Quincy, Massachusetts, was going to be called the Constitution. So, the hull which becomes Lexington and gets converted in aircraft, into an aircraft carrier. So, these could have been class battle cruisers. Because let's be honest, even if they were officially called Lexington class, if Constitution was CC1 and Constitution had launched first, they'd have been called the Constitution class. So these are big. They are big in terms of the plans of the US Navy. And they're big in terms of the government's plan. Are they therefore about just about war fighting their construction? No. Again, if you're building ships for just a war fighting reasons, there are plenty of names you can pick. Because let's be honest, when you're thinking about ships involved in war fighting, You're also thinking of 
how do I put this? Losing them. And to show you how serious they were about using those names, USS Constitution, aka Old Ironsides herself, was officially renamed Old Constitution from the 1st of December 1917 to the 24th of July 1925. There is nothing more serious than the naming of ships when you are planning on using them for your presence mission. And that is what the Lexington class battle cruisers, and what we'll refer to them in this video as Lexington class battle cruisers are, were about. We can debate about their guns, we can debate about their armor, we can debate about their survivability in this or that scenario. That's perfectly fine. That's a fun way to encourage learning into details of the ships. But until we start to consider the fact they were built for a lot more than just war fighting, they were built to shape and win the peace as much as they were to fight, or rather provide the information and the scouting force in the war. Until we acknowledge that, we are missing half the picture. We're certainly missing a lot to do with these ships. James book plug. As ever, thank you for all your support. Without your support on ship shape for the trip to Australia, we couldn't do a trip to Australia. Without your support last year, I couldn't have done a trip to Canada. Without your purchases of this book, it would not be on its second edition. Without your funding through Patreon, through joining this channel, through subscribing through buying stuff on Spreadshirt, um, the Spreadshirt store and links down below and all those things, I would not have the money to buy the books, do the research trips I need to do to do this channel. Without you watching this channel and seeing the adverts and sitting through them, I know they're boring or being a Prime member and not having to sit through them, I wouldn't have the money to run this channel. I wouldn't have the money to do the research, which I love doing, so thank you. Everything is thanks to you and your support. So, information warfare. That's what these ships are built for. They're information warfare ships. They are built to fight the information war in peacetime and in wartime. And you can see that with the images produced about them before they're even built. They're already engaged in that warfare. Look at this design. It's sleek. It's mean. It's sexy. Look at it. You know, you've got everything from this raked Atlantic clipper bow to the cut down at the back. You know, not quite stern. It's sort of it's the quarter deck sort of area. It's all cut down. This whole thing is designed to look fast. You've got the prow guns sitting at the front. You've got those huge, two huge stacks. Even the pagoda masts, well, you know, so they're not quite pagoda masts. Even the sort of those masts, they do almost look like pagoda masts in that sort of structure, but even the masts look not out of place. I don't want to say their actual name because it might cause someone to actually rebuild one. <sighs> but, you know, it looks good. And that's its point, because you think about it. In peacetime, they've got to maximise presence. Their job is to turn up everywhere. Turn up everywhere. And be photographed. And be seen. These are the vessels which are going to do world tours. 
like the Royal Navy does with the Empire crews with HMS Hood and HMS Repulse. These are the ships which are going to cruise around the world. They're going to do visits to Japan where the ambassadors go and go, Hello, hello everyone. Look at our lovely ship. We're here for peace and harmony and greeting to say how lovely it is to be friends. They're going to turn up in China and go, well, don't we bring peace and love. They're going to turn up in India or in Australia and go, look... America is powerful. We know you're part of the British Empire, but we're powerful too. They're going to turn up in Europe and sail through the Mediterranean looking glorious in the sun and go, Look how fast, how graceful, how gorgeous we are. They're going to turn up in Britain and look statuesque and proud. And they are going to be the whole time presenting this strength this capability of the U.S. Navy. They're going to go around South America and go, ha ha, finally we have a Navy stronger than all of you and we have something you don't have for once. We have battle cruisers. Look at us. Look at how fast. Look at how beautiful we are. Look at what we are. And that's their purpose. They go around creating a stir. That's what battle cruisers are for in peacetime. Therefore, giving the image of capability. Therefore, lots of people getting this picture in their mind of a huge ship. So with one ship, you can therefore be a presence in a very large region. Because this ship turns up and leaves an impression in your mind. And every time you see another ship of the Navy, you remember this one. And that's the point. Every time you see a cruiser, or a sloop, or a gunboat that's flying the same flag, you remember that flag flying on this beast. And you go, US Navy. That's something. And the thing is, that is what battle cruisers do. So what about their wartime role? Well, their wartime role is, again, is information. Sorry. Because in wartime, their role is to secure a scouting force. The Japanese have battle cruisers. They have the Congo class already. They have an existing clear and present danger to the ability of US cruisers to gather information. And on top of that, the Japanese are planning their next generation of battle cruisers, the Amagi class. How? How do you counter this? You can only counter this with your own battle cruisers. And this is where the problem really lies. Because if you're just building a battle cruiser for the presence mission and for the commerce mission, the economic warfare sort of role, you build a battle cruiser. Two words. But the moment you start needing to build something to go and engage other battle cruisers in the information role, both information acquisition and information denial roles, because you have to cover both roles, you're having to build battle cruisers, one word. Now there's a debate as to when you, the Royal Navy makes this transition. I'd say the first generations, two generations, the Invincibles and the Infaticals, are definitely battle cruiser two words. And I'd say really it's once you get on to Queen Mary's edging it. Lion. Queen Mary is sort of. Mm, and then there's Tiger, which is definitely heading towards the battle cruiser one word. And Hood is the epitome of battle cruiser one word. And then it sort of goes. On the spectrum, fast battleship beyond battle cruiser, one word, and pure battleship at the other end. And 
where ships fit on that whole spectrum of capital ship spectrum is, is a fun debate to have. But the point is, the moment you're going from the present economic mission of the capital ship spectrum, and you are moving along to getting to this sort of this end, which is the fighting battles spectrum, you are having to exchange some of your speed from. You are having to start to design your ship around taking damage not just dealing out damage not just being a instrument of power of dashing attacks of a lamb but something of actually taking and receiving punishment whilst dispensing it at the same time and that moves you along the spectrum now, this is where the Lexingtons tend to traditionally run into trouble as a battle cruiser design. Because honestly, if you look at their design and you validate them on the battle cruiser two words roll, they are pretty much an exceptionally good design. The moment we start to think about them actually taking or receiving damage, that's when we start to get a little bit worried about some of their systems about some of their structures because they aren't particularly heavily armored in that regard they have a five to seven inch belt they have barbettes which are between five and nine inches they have turret faces of 11 inches the sides six inches a 12 inch conning tower a deck one and a half to 2.25 inches and the thing is I could be really cruel, and I could bring up a G3 design here, but I won't. I'll bring up Hood. And her armor is 6 to 12 inches in belt. Decks, 0.75 to 3 inches. Okay, some are less, but some are more. Her turrets are between 11 and 15 inches of armour. Okay, that's a lot more armour around them. Barbettes, 5 to 12 inches, depending on where you're talking about in the barbette. And realistically, they should be, to an extent, contemporaries. They should be. The speed of the Lexington's 33 knots, or 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. The speed of Hood, 32 knots, or 5,332 nautical miles at 20 knots. Lexington's four twin 16 inch guns, Hood four twin 15 inch guns. Power in a Lexington 180,000 shaft horsepower thanks to uh, 16 water tube boilers driving the, uh, their famous turbo electric drive and four shafts. Hood 24 Yarrow boilers, 144,000 shaft horsepower and four geared steam turbines. Thirty six thousand shaft horsepower bought, bought them an extra knot. Displacement forty four thousand two hundred tons, pretty much standard load. For um, the Lexington class, forty five thousand three hundred fifty four tons in deep load, hood forty seven thousand four hundred thirty tons in deep load.
they're interesting ships. And they're comparable. But I would argue that Hood Hood is certainly a battle cruiser. I also think this is always kind of interesting to me because it says battle cruiser one numbers one to four, and we know of course there were six Lexington class battle cruisers named down, laid down. We also know that one to four were ordered from Four River Shipyard, Quincy, Newport News Shipbuilding, yeah, uh, Shipbuilding, Virginia. New York Shipbuilding, Camden, New, again, New Jersey, and Newport News Shipbuilding, Virginia. So, they're, they're ordered from roughly three yards. Four vessels spread over three yards. And then we have number five and six. Constitution of the United States. Both laid down on the 25th of September, 1920. The same date as the Saratoga's laid down. Months before the Lexington, what was originally planned as the Constitution, Lexington is laid down. And before, no, about a month after Constellation had been laid down in Newport News, Virginia. And, again, months before Ranger, which was originally called Lexington, was named down in Virginia. But both 5 and 6 were to be built at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, 6 ships being built at 4 yards. 2 yards. Newport News and Philadelphia Naval Shipyard get to each. I don't know, there's something to do with the congressman in those waters, or some was very, very successful. Now, this design did get better, and as you can see, this is this is design which is the painting I showed you earlier. You can see a lot of portholes in this drawing. And I'm fairly certain some would have been fake because they would have uh, got rid of some of them or painted them in to it looks like a porthole from a distance. When it's not one, it's an armor belt. But also, this is the fact that their design starts off with as this economic warfare presence vessel. And you can argue that perhaps in the expanse of the Pacific, they did not expect them to often come up solo, or even in pairs, unsupported against enemy battle cruisers. Perhaps the idea was that they would lure Kug Congos and the Margis. Congos they could probably stand up to and have a fight with, but the Maggies would have been more interesting. Lord them to their deaths at the hands of the Colorados or other super US battleships, and who knows what would have come along. It's one of the interesting things is we often talk about what happens if this class is completed or that class, and I've done my own video which is basically Admirals, G3s are completed. Admirals as carriers, G3s as capital ships. What happens? And yeah, I think it was the Admirals, the Tosas, uh, I think, and the Lexingtons all completed. Might have been completed as a 50 50 scenario or something like that. I think it was a 50 50 scenario, so they completed three as battle cruisers and three as aircraft carriers. And what exactly happens? And it becomes really quite interesting. Because. 
if there's a treaty which then limits no more production, those ships are going to be some of the finest, fastest, most upgradable, viable vessels that any navy has. So immediately they're going to go, for all their strengths and weaknesses, to the top of the pile of requests of, we need to upgrade this, we need to improve this. Which means they're going to be modernized up the wazoo. No matter what happens, they are going to be modernized up the wazoo. But, as well as that, you have an honest system generating from that of, well, if you have no treaty, what's next generation? What's the battle cruisers that are battle cruisers, one word, or even maybe even fast battleships, which come after the Lexingtons, which come after the G3s, which come after the Imakis? What does that next generation look like? What does your next generation look like in a world where the Royal Navy has N3 battleships with 18-inch guns? G3s in service. Where the US Navy has Colorados and Lexingtons in service. And maybe even Dakotas. Where the IJN has Nagato and has the, you know, has the Amagis and the Italians have the Francisca Caracolas and who knows, maybe even some of the better French vessels get finished off. Preferably not the class that produced the burn, but they, they, they had a good dreadnought design in there. I'm, I'm struggling to think of one, but I'm sure they had a good one in them somewhere. Look, the, the Dunkirks don't come from nowhere, okay? They, 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 there is good design in there somewhere. Um, that is a a very interesting world. And as a world which can teach us a lot about the sacrifices made and the priorities of nations when we look at what they could have had and could have been building, what they were prepared to sacrifice in those regards when they were making the treaty. And that makes you, uh, gives you an idea of what was going on in the treaties and behind the scenes of the treaties when they were making those agreements by the treaty. Because what capabilities, what capacities have they lost? through that treaty system. And we can pretend you don't know what you are or what you never have, but the US Navy didn't go to the trouble of renaming the USS Constitution because they didn't know the value of what they were getting. They knew what they were going to get and they knew what they got what they ended up losing. Alright, I tend to end these sort of questions, so um I'm going to keep this one simple. Please, and if you want to post pictures of them to Discord, I'd love to see what your designs and ideas might be like for what the next generation of US Navy battlecruiser post-Lexington would have been in a world where the Lexingtons, the G3s, and the Amagis all get built for some reason. I want to hear what... I want to see what your next generation would look like. It'd be really cool. And at some point, if I, with the new edition of the book coming out, if I do get a box of those sent to me, and if people are agreeable that it's suitable, I will set up a design competition with a set of design. The prizes being signed copies of the books. I've got a few who I already want to send out to some people if they come through. There are people who I've promised books. But usually you get a certain number of books. And if I get that number of books, I've got about half of them I need to send out. And half of them I would want to keep for prizes. And I'd love to hear your views if you think that's a good idea. Anyway, Battle of Hakadokte. I think that's come up and that's happened, but you know. You should know what the brew ships are now by this point, but I'm recording all these now in April before I get anywhere near May because I need to get ahead on my recordings if I'm going to cover June. <laughs> I need to get ahead. June is going to be a lot of videos. June is going to require me to f record 30 videos before I go. That's a lot of videos. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed. Take care.